and welcome to Nikki Talks. Uh, this is the sixth in a series of shows about domestic violence. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And today I am very fortunate to have Shana Doberman with me. Welcome, Shana. Thank Shana you. is from Hawk, and um, I'm going to start out just asking you a little bit about the Hawk services and, and maybe in a little more detail so that mm-hmm. people really get an idea of sure. what is a support group or what can I expect on a hotline call mm-hmm. or what would happen if I needed a court advocate. Sure, absolutely. I mean, that could easily take up most of the time that yes, we have, I so know, I'll, I I'll try to keep it as concise and informative as, as I can. Yep. Um, so the first and probably most important of our services is the hotline. Um, It runs 24 hours a day, and it's an anonymous way for folks to get immediate access to information about resources, whether it's our services, additional services in the community. Mm, We get calls not necessarily just from our direct community. Sometimes we get calls from out of state. We've even got calls from outside of the country, so we're able to connect folks with resources in their area um, and certainly able to provide support remotely. Um, Does it have a multi you know, uh, language, does it have language capacity? or We do. Yeah. Um, primarily it's staffed by English-speaking folks, but we do have access to a language line. So yeah. if the caller, oh, yeah, that's great. Um, and we use a professional answering service, so the yep. calls are answered live by um, by an answering service, so they take down the caller's information, whether mm-hmm. that's a phone number and a first name. Mm-hmm. So if someone isn't comfortable disclosing their, their own first name, they can give whatever name they like, mm-hmm. and then the answering service will call whoever is scheduled to be on call for that moment. And then we will call them back. And if they alert the service that they need a particular language, then we know to call through our answer service so we can have immediate support in whatever language someone needs. So that greatly increases our ability to to support folks. Um, The average call is probably 15 minutes or less. Um, Mm -hmm. We we try not to keep them too long because if there's only one person on call, we need to be available yeah. for anyone else that might come in. Right. So, but it's um, it's often the gateway for our services and additional services in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, usually after that, someone might be connecting with someone directly in our office for an intake. That would typically take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. And we're getting a lot of detailed information from them about why they feel like they might want to connect with us. All of that yeah. information is confidential. Every service that we offer is free. Yep. So we don't yep. have to worry about insurance, anything like that. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we can really get a sense of that person's situation one-on-one. Maybe they just need emotional support. Maybe they need mm-hmm. safety planning. So we'll gauge based on how that interaction goes where to direct that person from there. Um, we also do, um, that, and that's the gateway to any other service that we provide right. um, as far as direct service. So if someone's interested in a support group, they would need to t- complete an intake first. And then we can use that information to direct them to whether it's a domestic violence 101 group, to really learn about the cycle of violence, the impact it has on families and relationships, or if that person's really needing more of an empowerment, Mm self-care, self-esteem type of group, we might direct them to that. Mm. Um, The only group that we offer that doesn't require that is the free yoga classes that I offer once a month at Treetop Yoga. Yeah. Um, so that's so no intake. For no that. intake for that whatsoever. Um, yeah, those great. those classes are gender inclusive. They're also yeah. open to teens, unlike yeah. the rest of our services. Yeah. So someone can just show up to that class. They don't ever have to disclose what their situation was, why they feel like that might be important for them. They can just show up, no talking whatsoever, have an hour, 15 minutes of healthy self-care and mm-hmm. then hopefully leave a little bit more peaceful yeah, than they started. Excellent. Um, so how many groups is Hawk running right now and where? Um, most of our groups are um, consistently offered out of the Salem and Lynn offices. Okay. So, um, and those are closed groups, so they're not open for drop-in. They would need uh. to complete an intake prior and have, uh. um, they don't necessarily need to be ongoing work with one-on-one with an advocate after that, but, um, but they would need to be connected with one of our offices before they could partake in that. And so once you get a critical number, mm-hmm. it's a closed group. It's a closed group, yeah. So yeah, it could so be... Three people minimum. Yeah, it can yeah. be up to like six or seven, maybe eight, depending on. Um, but we we definitely wouldn't want them to be super large groups. No, no, right, but right. So, so you have empowerment groups where you where you work with survivors, mm-hmm. and I'd like to hear more about that. But and yeah. then also groups where you are doing possibly some safety planning, and. Um, 
psycho ed about mm-hmm. domestic violence? Yeah, the domestic violence 101 class is definitely more of a psycho ed okay. um, yeah. curriculum. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, and mm-hmm. the self-esteem class is a particular curriculum that's used as well. Oh, so right now um, we have two advocates out of our Salem office who've mm-hmm. been trained on that curriculum. So mm-hmm. they're the ones that can offer that right now. Oh, um, the other great. thing about both of those offices is we have bilingual staff yeah. at both of those sites. Yeah. So we right. offer support groups in English and Spanish at both locations. Mm-hmm. So. Awesome. Great. Okay, so hotline support groups, and is there counseling? Um, not in the traditional sense. So yeah. We don't have clinicians not on clinical, staff, right. but we do work very closely, um, particularly out of the Cape Ann office. We have a yeah. very strong partnership with children, friends, and family. Right. So we also partner with them for our parent-child trauma recovery program. Right. Um, we call that PCTRP for <laughs> short, which isn't any shorter. No, it's almost um, as hard. <laughs> it's almost harder. as long. Um, but it's it's one of my favorite services yeah. that we offer, um, and it's also the only one that's geared directly towards children. Um, so for families that have children that are under the age of 12 that have experienced either directly or vicariously physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, verbal, psychological abuse within the family, um, we partner with clinicians in the community for Cape Ann, that would be children, friends, and family. Yeah. In Salem, it's the North Shore Medical Center, and there's also a program in Lynn. Um, so it's 12 sessions or more um, with the protective parent, and that could also be the protective grandparent if it's sure. the grandparent yeah. that has custody. Um, yeah. So, And that's really um, targeted trauma-informed therapy to address directly whatever the child has been exposed to that the protective adult really wishes they hadn't. Yeah. Um, so it's not beating around the bush. It's really saying, oh, so mom told me that you saw this yep. or we're yep. aware that you experienced this. Yeah. So it's really naming it, obviously, in a developmentally appropriate sure. way. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that might be using play therapy, mm-hmm. drawing. Um, but it's it's a really beautiful program mm-hmm. um, that, you know, when when utilized, really helps families heal. Oh, um, Yeah. And I think also it, it, it sort of provides a safety net for families because so often um, victims are um, wary and afraid of DCF, mm-hmm. you know, and hold back information that's right. really critical right. about what's happening in the home. And, and you know, having the parent-child trauma recovery program just is this nice net between, mm-hmm. you know, and you have a place to really explore yeah. your concerns. I'm excited that it's yeah. here in Gloucester. Yeah, me it's too. It's really it's, great. We worked really hard to bring that program here. Really um, we were very lucky to get the grant funding so that we could expand that to this part of our service mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. Um, we have been able to help um, several families mm-hmm. um, complete the program. We've only had it running here for just over a year. Yeah. Um, and it's it's already been a really big success. Yeah, um, wonderful. The other great thing about that is, you know, as as I know you're aware, therapy is an ongoing, healing is an ongoing process. So once mm-hmm. someone completes that program, if there are other children in the family, mm-hmm. um, we might enroll a second child. Oh, um, once good. the initial, yeah. you know, you would start with whoever is most acute yep. um, based yep. on the needs and the behaviors that the child is exhibiting so that you can really target the area of greatest need. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to stop there. So we could enroll a second I child. Know that. That's really great. And then we can also connect them to additional therapeutic services, sure. whether that's in-home therapy, individual therapy. Um, so it's it's another gateway to a lot of additional supports that a family might not have explored otherwise. Yeah. Um, and it's all trauma-informed. Yes. So. Yeah, that's really great. So. Um, okay, so how about advocacy my other favorite part of our <laughs> um, of our services we have advocates stationed in every court in the service area so Hawk operates uh, within 23 cities and towns we only have three office locations but we serve um, you know a, a wider swath of the community and mm. so Salem District Court Essex County Probate Court Lynn District Court Peabody District Court and Gloucester District Court mm-hmm. um, every day that there's a judge on the bench For most courts, that's every day, Monday through Friday. For Gloucester, that's only Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. Um, So, But on those days, we have an advocate, at least one advocate, in all of those courts who's available without an appointment just to assist someone through the restraining order process, the civil legal process. If they want to know what that looks like, what criteria is involved, how do I file, what's the process, um, what does that look like? They don't need an appointment to do that, and yeah, they don't so actually great. need to be an active hot client either. Those advocates are stationed in the court, rain or shine, regardless of whether or not they know someone's coming. 
Yeah, that's so great. Yeah. Yeah, that's such an important support. So they'll really walk someone through the process, help Perfect, yeah. translate <laughs> all yeah. of the legal language yep. and say this is what they're looking for in the order. Um, you know, this is how you, this is what's coming next. This is what the judge is asking you. This mm -hmm. is what that means. It's such a terrifying yeah. thing when you have all Absolutely. that going on at once. Yeah, your adrenaline kicks in, you know, oh, the, yeah. you know, every, and court is a public place. Yes. So you well, never know who's there. Well, and also the alleged abuser could be standing very close to you. Yeah. At least it used to be true. It probably still is up there. Yeah. Not typically for the initial, um, no, for the yeah, initial no, no. hearing, but certainly if a temporary order is granted, when they go back for the return date yeah. to ask for an extension, yeah. that's really when that advocate, um, is really crucial. Yeah. Um, we can't speak on behalf of the client and we can't tell them what to say, mm -hmm. but there have been, you know, cases where we've literally held someone up. Yeah. Of um, not just standing next to them. Um, and then being able to offer ongoing support. So once the order has been granted, if it's been granted, you know, to go through, okay, so this is what just happened. Yeah. Um, you're probably not going to remember any of this yep. or fragments of it at best. Right. So if you wake up tomorrow and you don't remember what this order means, mm -hmm. what criteria is on here, you can come back and mm -hmm. ask us if you'd like to know what's going on with the criminal case. We can follow mm -hmm. up on that for you too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a piece of the work that doesn't involve an intake. Um, so if mm -hmm. someone hasn't really identified as, I'm a survivor, I fall under this box, mm -hmm. and I therefore want services from an agency like Hawk, they can still get that support through the civil and criminal process mm -hmm. without having to attach that label to their identity. Yeah. Um, and that's, um, that's really helpful for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> is there, um, I believe there is a community collaboration around um, high risk. There is. Um, there's high risk teams throughout the state. Um, we participate in three. There's mm -hmm. one out of, um, out of the Lynn District Court and Salem District Court, and we also sit on the Gloucester District Court. Yeah. Um, so for Gloucester District Court, we would be mm -hmm. looking at cases that involve either the um, Gloucester Police Department, Rockport Police, and Essex. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, that's great. It's a really, it's a really great um, integrative collaboration between um, the police departments, corrections, the DA's office. Mm -hmm. um, there's a representative from the IPAEP program, yep. um, which formerly was known as Batterers Intervention right. Training. Right. Now it's the Intimate Partner Abuse Education Program. Yep. Um, so um, it's a really, it's a really wonderful way for us to all share information. It is to help and keep families lives, safe, not to help mention. hold their, help um, the offending party be yep. held accountable, and hopefully get them some restorative justice. Yeah. So that they're also getting the support that they need to not repeat offend, not end up back in jail. Um, yes. You know. Yes. And what about um, hospital-based program? We do have that out of our Salem site. Um, we partner with North Shore Medical Center, and we have two staff now that are embedded in the Salem Hospital. So during regular you know, business hours, um, Monday through Friday, there's um, someone that will answer a pager system. So if anyone oh, is great. at Salem Hospital and they yeah. are flagged either through triage or they disclose to a hospital worker, that could be the emergency room, it could be inpatient programs, outpatient programs, um, anyone who's within the hospital campus at North Shore Medical Center, if they, um, if a worker becomes aware that this might be part of their story, um, mm -hmm. we have a way for them to contact someone immediately. Mm -hmm. And you know, depending on what's happening that day, our staff might be able to go directly to that patient's room. If not, maybe they're going to connect with them and follow up at a later date, mm -hmm. depending on the level of need. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really great access point because it, it could is, be yeah, the oh, only absolutely. confidential yeah. space that someone has. Yep, yep. And so do you know about how many staff work? I mean, I know some part-time and some full-time yeah. at Hawk. Um, 27 total 27. right 27. now. 27, yeah. And Hawk serves 23 cities and towns, yes. right? So I, I like to say that to give people kind of the idea mm -hmm. of what doing that yeah. work is like and spreading yourself yep. across 23 cities So it's cities barely a towns. staff person per town, if yeah. you look at it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Three so. quarters of a staff person per... Yeah, yeah it's a, a, a pretty awesome endeavor. Um, so, Shana, I wanted to ask just briefly what brought you to this work I mean how what what's mm -hmm. your journey been yeah. kind of to get here <laughs> um I I actually really like being asked that question because Good. Hawk is responsible for me getting involved in this work mm -hmm. um I was a senior in high school and um one of our long since gone um outreach staff workers 
did a week long basically the domestic violence 101 class yes. for my for my senior class yeah um and i remembered very vividly i don't remember the person's name i don't remember with a lot of detail everything that we discussed sure yeah but i had two very um very powerful memories that have stuck with me yeah um, i remember exactly where i was sitting in class huh. and i remember thinking first i can't believe someone's this is what some this is someone's job Mm-hmm. This is what some people do for work. This is a thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I want to do that. I, that's yeah. that's what I'm. That's sign me up. Yeah. When do I get started? Yeah. And I captained my first team for our walk that year. I did PSAs for my school. Yeah. And I've been doing this work ever since. So yeah. going on almost twenty years. Um, mm-hmm. The other very powerful thought that I have, and I and I still feel that way today, is that you are too late. High school is way too late to be talking I to. Agree anyone about Mm -hmm. issues about consent healthy relationships um how to be respectful of each other you know having agency over your own body Mm -hmm. um by the time you're a senior in high school you're already dating you're already engaging in all kinds of things and you have established patterns of behavior that you now might need to unlearn yeah um so that um that started me on the path that i'm Mm -hmm. very actively still working on now and it's it's been i've worked very closely with hawk over the years, I used to work yeah. for the Rape Crisis Center, um, right. Right. and it's it's very much like a homecoming for me to be um, officially part of the agency now that started me. Yeah, yeah. On this that's process, great. so yeah, that's really great. I know there are those sort of epiphany moments in our lives. Mm-hmm. It sounds like one of those. Yeah. Um, maybe we could take a few minutes to talk about. Um, the different kinds of abuse because many people, you know, they think about a broken nose and a mm-hmm. black eye and they they just don't have the education to understand right. the really broad yeah. spectrum of how domestic violence can happen and how it mm-hmm. can look. No, I, I think that's a really important piece to, yeah. to bring in. Um, not everyone's story looks like a Lifetime movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, those situations absolutely exist. If they mm-hmm. didn't, my agency wouldn't exist. We wouldn't mm-hmm. have high-risk teams. Mm-hmm. Um you know, there are people that are in very serious, you know, physical danger, and that's yeah. um, an important consideration for them and how they operate. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the vast majority of people who have experienced some form of abuse um, in their relationships, it doesn't it doesn't usually rise to that most serious level. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts with things like language and being hold into very rigid gender roles um, and old fashioned stereotypes. So this is what it means to be a man. Okay, right. And right. and if you step outside of your man box, right. then we're gonna call you all kinds of names mm-hmm. and slurs. And those slurs and insults are usually related to either a woman's anatomy mm-hmm. or behaviors that are typically associated with what it means to be a woman. A female, right. Um, and that's, right. so that's sort of where all of this starts. Yeah. Um, and that abusive language, um, emotional manipulation, or, or even in the cultural sense, um, you know, there is such a thing as cultural, I- cultural identity abuse. Um, sure, so, yeah. you know, if you're adhering to rigid gender roles and you're also using stereotypical aspects of your culture or community to justify coercive so or controlling behavior like that. so in our culture men do this yeah and in our culture though you know the women do xyz yeah and and if you're not doing if you're not following along those lines then you're you know you're not a real um whatever you are <laughs> yeah um, you know like wife, yeah um yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's not how we do things in our community. Yeah. And, um, all, and then you have all those different communities yeah. and we all have different cultural standards. Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah. you can make a specific example for just about any, yeah. any identity that someone can yeah. come up with. Um, mm-hmm. And really using, we see abusers using that. The, the key piece of it is that if someone's repeatedly engaging in a pattern of behavior and they're mm-hmm. using their behavior to gain control over another person to make that other person feel smaller Mm -hmm. um, while they're, you know, building themselves up to feel bigger. And over time, you know, you hopefully a relationship starts off with two folks of equal stature and then little by little, the other person starts to feel smaller and their voice starts to get quieter. Um, And the other person's taking up more and more space and energy 
Um, mm-hmm. I can picture and, this in your description. And that, good description. that can exist without the other person ever laying a hand yeah. on the other. Yeah. Um, and Especially over time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Or if someone finds themselves modifying their behavior mm-hmm. to avoid the extreme behavior of another person, mm-hmm. that might be an indication that this relationship, you know, maybe we don't want, maybe that person isn't ready to label their partner as abusive, but yeah. I think we could say that that relationship isn't healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, we also see a lot of financial manipulation, um, and that can also tie into the psychological and cultural aspect of things. So yeah. if you're using like, oh, I'm the man, I'm, you know, just to use that example, and I'm going to control all the finances. Um, so or, you can't have a debit way. card, you can't have a checking account. Yeah, or having to account for all of your yeah, spending habits. Um, yeah, So, I mean, that's something that we, you know, that we see. Yeah. Um, or if someone isn't being respectful of another person's sexual boundaries. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, maybe there isn't a lot of overt force happening in that relationship but Mm -hmm. if someone's engaging in behaviors that they're really not comfortable with Mm -hmm. and they don't feel like they're able to have that conversation and that their boundaries will be respected right that absolutely falls under you know under that category too Mm -hmm. um so there's there's a lot of different ways that someone's relationship might not be healthy might not be equal um you know or equitable imbalanced yeah yeah yeah, I always think one of the most, um, I don't know, I guess dangerous and um, disturbing patterns in domestic violence is um, if an abuser uses many of those tactics that you're talking mm-hmm. about um, and, you know, the victim becomes so beaten down that she, I'll, I'll use the word she here, mm. um, isolates, mm-hmm. you know, and becomes more and more withdrawn and there's almost like a sense of, shame around Mm -hmm. if I could let this happen in my relationship there must be something wrong with me Mm -hmm. so then there's that sort of social withdrawal which just makes everything worse I think what happens for most you know for most relationships is you know the person that is modifying their behavior yeah to appease the other person they've seen glimpses over time of what that person's capable of in a good way. Yes. Um, Yes. You know, they've had the hearts and flowers. They've had the honeymoon phase. It probably started off beautiful. Most relationships that can be considered abusive don't start off with a bang. Right. Um, Right. They start off fantastic. Yep. Um, Almost too good to be true, you know, in some cases. And, you know, your, your victim survivor has seen that the other person is capable of being better. Right. Um, of being kind, of being compassionate. Right. And sometimes that person never existed. Yeah. And sometimes that person is there, but they're buried. Um, and we're all a product of our life experiences. And there's usually right. a reason why someone is the way they are. Yeah. Whether it's because of learned patterns of behavior, whether it's because right. of some cognitive or psychological issue, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't really matter why. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of the work that we do with folks is helping them recognize what their own voice sounds like again. Um, Or maybe for the first time. Maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, most of the time when I'm interacting with someone initially, they have no idea what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're certainly not ready to leave. Mm -hmm. That's, That's that might not even be an option. That's a hard thing for people to understand, I think. I mean, it's kind of a classic. Why doesn't she just leave? Mm -hmm. But but a lot of people yeah. don't know the answer to that. Right. A lot of folks don't necessarily know what they want. But mm-hmm. usually by the time I'm interacting with someone, something has shifted for them. And whatever has yeah. been happening to this point isn't for whatever reason. It's not working anymore. Yep. And Which brought them to you. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. folks don't find themselves in these relationships yeah. because right. they're stupid right. or because they're weak. Mm-hmm. Um, the folks that I have the privilege of working with are some of the most intelligent, yeah, incredibly compassionate, and oh yeah, fiercely sure. strong people that you have yeah. ever met, and they stay, yeah, because they can put up with more, yeah, and get by with less. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not because they like being treated the way they're being treated, and it's not because they. Um, it's often not because they don't see what's in front of them. It's because they know the other person's capable of being better. Mm-hmm. Or at least right. they feel and they hope that. Right. And they're able to manage what they're dealing with until they can't anymore. For whatever reason, they just can't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then they look back and think, why, you know, why? Mm -hmm. Um, And it doesn't, you know, and usually it's because they had more compassionate, more compassion for the other person than they do for themselves. Yes. Yes. Which is sadly not an uncommon phenomenon. (laughs) You're sort of touching upon what you mentioned earlier is the concept of the cycle of violence. And I like the way you say Mm -hmm. that, 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 you know, that a victim can see um, her abuser in his very best light Mm -hmm. and remember that. And and, have compassion for why they are the way they are. Yeah. Um, You know, and for, and I I do want to, you know, to make sure that we're mentioning, you know, the other, um, the other ways that these relationships can, can look like, because there are way more men that have experienced unhealthy abusive relationships than the general population would would yeah. believe right um it's much more common than folks think yeah um, and really it, hard for men to come forward incredibly hard and it's yeah. it's diff- i don't want to say think that it's easy for anyone no, to no, say no, no. no hi i'm gonna put this label on myself and that also means that i have to put this label on my partner because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, to some extent if you're going to identify as a victim as a survivor as someone who is being abused then what does that mean about the person that you're receiving that behavior from right and most folks are not willing to label their partner, their co-parent, you know, someone who yeah. they care deeply about. They're not willing to put that label on them. Yep. And that's a huge internal barrier. It is. Um, and for, is. for men who have experienced this, regardless of their sexual orientation, um, you know, whether their partner is male or female or trans, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter that much for them. But our general society makes jokes. Oh, they, don't, yeah. they don't believe that it's possible. Um, and regardless of whether that man is experiencing physical violence or whether he's just been, I, I shouldn't say just cause that sounds too minimizing, whether he's experiencing yeah. verbal or psychological abuse, yeah. which we know is much more damaging over time. It is. Um, it physical is. wounds heal, but yeah. the, the insidiousness of Absolutely. verbal and psychological abuse, yeah. it just stays with you. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that are very different about his experience, um, and then for folks that don't fall within the gender binary, mm-hmm. um, there's there's an enormity of other barriers and, yes, and roadblocks right. to services, to support, right. um, that, that makes their situation even more complicated. Right. And then if you're dealing with someone who doesn't have documentation, mm-hmm. um, there's a whole other level of concern there. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember, we used to do a, um, a volunteer uh, training exercise called blankets of distress mm. i don't know if you ever heard about it but that's what it was mm-hmm. it was basically just you know saying look at all of the things that are silencing this person mm-hmm. and and you know they keep piling up everything yeah. from immigration status mm-hmm. to english as a second language mm-hmm. to you know all kinds of things and eventually if the blankets get heavy enough you can't hear that person's no, you're, voice no you're suffocating yeah you're suffocating um, so we only have a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to ask before we close two things. Um, one is, what's your advice for people, or just your cherry thoughts, um, for people who are um, witnessing a child, an aunt, a best friend, mm-hmm. going through um, and trying to survive an abusive relationship? What is the best way for that bystander to really help? Um, I think there's... I think there's there's two important things that they I mean there's a lot of things they can do. Um, the maybe this isn't the first, but it's the first thing that's coming to mind for me. Yeah. Um, that folks might not necessarily think about is they can take that experience and share it mm-hmm. with the young people in their lives, mm-hmm. with their friends and coworkers and colleagues and other family members who anybody who will listen about hey I saw this situation and it yeah. and and this is how it impacted me and that didn't really feel right and that's not that's not how we treat people yeah um there's always a learning opportunity yes um and so important. one thing we know for sure is that a problem doesn't get fixed by ignoring it mm-hmm. um so I, I would definitely want to just plant that seed mm-hmm. um and then as far as interacting with the person of concern um you know, letting them know in an open way that, you know, I just want to check in with you. Are you, yeah. Are you feeling all right? right. Or, you know, I just want you to know if you ever need to talk about anything, mm-hmm. um, I, I might not know what you're going through. I might not have the answers, but I'm willing to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's the non-judgmental, really critical. Yeah. The, the worst thing that anyone can say to someone that they're concerned about is what you should, 
have to, must, can't. Exactly. Bad words. Any of those, any of those directives. Um, it's one, it's another reason why folks don't necessarily want to connect with someone like me because they think I'm going to tell them what to do. Exactly. And that's actually part of our job. Yeah. <laughs> um, to be unbiased. Like yeah. I can offer you guidance. I can offer you information about what one course of action might lead you to, but I don't have a personal opinion about what decisions you make. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, your choices are your so own critical. and my door is open. It might be locked yeah. for security reasons, but right. figuratively my door is always open exactly. no matter what you choose. I've had folks drop restraining orders, yeah. put them back on. Yeah. I've stood up with folks as they've in court, as they've vacated, vacated the um, order. an yeah. order of protection. Yep. Um, and you know, that can be a difficult thing to help someone through, but they need to know that we're here unconditionally. Yeah. Um, that's uh, to me, that's the to some degree, it's the most important thing, and it's the most important message because we all want to tell people what to do. Right. You know, just leave or yeah. whatever it is we want to say, and it's not helpful. It does not no. help. I mean, you might need to share that with someone else. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I saw this happen, and like, right. I really care about my friend, and I really want to tell them this. Yeah. You know, right. absolutely have that conversation, right. just not with the person you're concerned about. Yeah. No, exactly. It shouldn't right. be the other person. It shouldn't. If if you have a survivor in your life, or you think you do. It's not that person's responsibility to help you feel better with what exactly. you're experiencing vicariously. Exactly. They have enough on their plate. Yeah. Um, I would encourage that person to seek their own support. Mm -hmm. And that might be with us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're happy to work with significant others mm -hmm. um, yeah, and providers. That's good. That's Maybe great. a provider's client does not want to work with us. We can still work with the provider. Give yeah. them guidance. Give them feedback. Um, yeah. Even without disclosing who their client is. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really important. Um, I think we are out of time, actually, but maybe you could just end um, with sharing the hotline number for Hawk. Absolutely. Um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call us at 1-800-547-1649. Okay. I think we can reach across and shake hands. Thank you, Shana.